ready to call uh, the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Committee to order. So the first thing I'll do is call roll. Joanne Adams. Joanne Adams. Here. Claire Batt. Claire Batt present. Patrice McCrary. Patrice McCrary. I'm here. Randy Poe. I'm here. Jamie Bowling. I am here. Allison Sloan. I am here. Soliana Messon. And I'm here. All right. So I am very excited to welcome our special guest for this presentation. They're going to, we have one review item, it's graduate profiles at state level policy. We have the UK Center for Next Generation Leadership uh, and with Karen Perry, Justin uh, Bethon, and uh, Neoma Hagens Flores. So I am really looking forward to this presentation. I feel like this is conversation that um, I feel like I need to be more up to speed on. I feel like uh, as a former elementary teacher, this was not something that I thought a lot about. Um, and I'm, it's becoming more and more of our conversations here. And I'm looking forward to, to digging in and learning a lot in this session. So thank you all for being here. And I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you guys for having us. We are so excited um, to be speaking to you guys today about a Kentucky profile of a graduate um, slash learner. My name is Neoma Hagens Flores. I'm an associate director um, at the center. Um, and us five together, um, there's our team um, up there on the screen. We're five small but mighty um, individuals who believe in advancing deeper learning principles in the state of Kentucky. Um, on our team, in addition to me, our, um, is our executive director, Dr. Lou Young, our directors, um, Ms. Karen Perry and uh, Dr. Justin Batman, and then our administrative assistant, um, Jenny Hall. Um, for the past decade, we have been working, next screen, for the, next, for the last decade, we have been working on advancing deeper learning in the state in four um, priority areas. One of those being professional learning. So we provide opportunities each year um, for schools and districts to engage in learning with us about um, deeper learning principles, which I'll talk a little bit about here in just a moment. Um, we also promote innovative learning practices by doing discussions like this and becoming intermediaries for um, districts around the state. Um, two years ago, we began um, offering the dual credit program through the University of Kentucky called uh, Next Gen Scholars. And then this year, we began our implementation of the continuing learning, uh, educational learning opportunity for um, T12 teachers in the state of Kentucky. Extremely. All of our learning is centered around um, our principles in which we call our Next Gen 9. Half of that is centered around our Next Gen learning principles, which is graduate competency, um, deeper learning, student agency, a performance assessment and crafting a robust teaching culture in school. Today we'll be focusing mainly on uh, this half of our Next Gen 9, really talking about graduate competencies. The second half is all structured around equity of opportunity for our students, um, for our staffs and administrators. So we believe in that all uh, curriculum should be culturally re relevant, all students should have access um, two robust learning environments, we believe in positive and restorative um, discipline, and in robust advising and mentoring for all students at all levels um, of all abilities. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see, we have worked with a multitude of districts across the state, um, from Eastern Kentucky to far Western Kentucky. Um, the different colors just represent the different kinds of initiatives or what they're, they are involved in such as um, the purple is our schools that are invested in our dual credit initiative. Um, but over the past decade, there are not many districts that we have not been in contact with or in conversations with about advancing deeper learning um, for all of our students. Um, while I could talk about us and what we do all day long, and we will be happy to answer any of those questions, um, I do want to turn it over to Dr. Bathin to start talking about um, profiles of a graduate in the Okay, awesome. And while we're just uh, giving a little shout outs, obviously we work pretty closely with Dr. Young on the board, but I was reminded that since Dr. Todd is also on the board, 
Next Gen actually traces its roots to um, his time as president of the University of Kentucky. He hired a dean, and he gave that dean, whose name is Mary John O'Hare, a priority to re-engage schools across the Commonwealth and to and position UK as a leader in sort of the direction and future movement of uh, P12 schools as well as higher ed. And so actually, you know, while we're here, we can just give a little bit of recognition to this is the culmination, or at least 11 years later, of Dr. Todd's vision and bringing in that name. So today, talk a little bit about profiles or portraits of a graduate, uh, portrait of a learner. It gets called different things. We have multiple folks in the room who have done this in the district level, and so they can speak to it at the district level. We want to speak nationally, mostly today, as we think about what would that look like at a state level. Um, so next slide. This is sort of tracing back to a basic definition of like what is this sort of graduate or learner profile. A community-wide vision statement, right? So for us, that would be a statewide vision statement, describing what a learner should know and be able to do before he or she graduates from the school, right? So a lot of this historically has been framed at the school or district level, but increasingly now is being framed at the state level. Okay, next slide. So, so much of this traces its roots to uh, Ed Leader 21, which was then taken over by Patel for Kids and the Portrait of a Graduate Work. Look up there at student A and student B. So student A, typically, traditionally we have to sort of define like what should student A know and be able to do when they leave school? And we said, well, they should know math, they should know science, English, social studies, you know, traditional stuff that we're used to. But this effort represents uh, a movement to say, what do we think is actually most important for them to know and be able to do as they're leaving school? So we might say master, content mastery, of course, we still care about those things. Uh, but also, like, we really need great communicators, great collaborators, creative problem solvers. So over on the right is just one example amongst many, 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 even in Kentucky there are many examples of what that sort of looks like once it's framed into a graphic. So that's sort of how we trace the roots into to that space. So let's move forward a slide and look at a few states that have been taking that idea to the state level. So here is Vermont's portrait of a graduate. We'll just linger on this one for a minute. You can see what they're doing. So they're defining you know, these six sort of high level categories of skills that they want for their learners, all learners in Vermont. They, we love, of course, that they put learner agency first, right? We want learners to own their own learning. And then they have, you know, three, it's not extensive, but a few clarifying sort of numbers underneath of that to give a sense of it. So what would that mean for a learner to own their own learning with learning agency? And then they do that same for global citizenship, academic proficiency, so you can see that, like, it's not that we are saying all of the traditional standards that we have focused on in reading and math, and it's still there. It's frequently labeled in the same way, academic proficiency, well-being, critical thinking and problem solving, and communication. Okay, so then that gets used in Vermont to help support what their sort of competency-based assessment model looks like. And we can discuss that more in the Q&A later, but that's how a state that takes this idea and goes to a state level, show you a few more. So next slide is Virginia. Virginia has laid out five C's of what they think is important. That sort of traces back some work to Dr. Tony Wagner and seven C's and there's, you know, so there is some history with each of these things, but C words frequently wind up being super important in this. Uh, a lot of C words in the Boone County portrait of a graduate, for instance, that uh, Dr. Pope would probably speak more to. And so that's what Virginia's winds up looking like and then defined underneath of that. Next slide is South Carolina's. South Carolina's, you can see where they've sort of framed theirs into three parts. There's world-class knowledge, Right, the rigorous standards in language, arts, and math for career and college readiness. This is like stuff that we are more traditionally used to. You can see what they put underneath of that, though, is a focus on STEM, arts, and social sciences. Then on the right-hand side of that screen is the world-class skills. Here's where your more traditional portrait of graduate skills come in, creativity and innovation, critical thinking, problem solving, 
you can read the rest. And then for South Carolina, it was important to have life and career characteristics down at the bottom. Okay, so let's do one more and look at Utah. Utah has sort of five big profile standards that they want. What it's not the resolution is not showing up the best, but the bottom is the timeline of when Utah is trying to implement this work. So um, they sort of put together their portrait of a graduate, and that came out in 2020. And so Utah is now sort of entering the implementation phase of their portrait of a graduate into 2021, just to give a sense of like where a state is on a timeline of implementation. OK, next slide. So let's look at us in Kentucky. We have long history with similar work. I think that we should always start, all of our conversations that almost always start with 1990. So next slide. This is one of my favorite statutes. I have a couple. These two in succession, 158.645 and 158.6451, are my two favorite statutes. So 645 lays out the capacities required of students in the public education system. Next slide, we'll zoom in a little bit on those capacities. So that particular statute lays out these eight capacities that in 1990, coming out of CARA, this is where we were at in a similar kind of statement. So that sort of serves as one piece of the foundation for similar work that we have in Kentucky. Next slide. Uh, we have a lot of districts in the state who have existing portraits of graduates that, you know, there, there is district level implementation of a similar idea in many districts. So we have the ability to dive into those districts and see, you know, what is important in Breckenridge County, what was important um, for Trigg or Marshall, Frankfurt Independent. I mean, you know, it's pretty widespread across the state. It, but not all districts have adopted one necessarily. I think Dr. Poe has some additional insight he can share in Q and A, maybe about how this there was some regional work happening in this effort. Um, so we have some district level implementation to go on already. And then one more slide. So then this work, which is in front of you, represents some work that actually David Cook behind us uh, led over the last few years. Uh, in the Competency, Education, and Assessment Consortium. So several of the districts from that previous slide got together and started to say, what do we think we would define as the anchor competencies at a statewide level? And you can see where those shaped up into those five. If that handout, turn that handout over that's on your desk, and you can see then that, that uh, competency assessment, education and assessment consortium work then took it to the next level to actually begin to define for each one of those what the performance outcomes would be and what would that look like at various grade levels. You know, what would we define as the progression of the empowered learner competency at grade 2, grade 5, grade 8, and grade 12. All existing work that we have um, to go on as as we as a state begin to think about what would it potentially look like. Because the next slide, uh, this is one that the chair of the board asked us to include, which is a goal that you all, I think, are pushing toward to develop a profile of a learner or graduate. So with that, I want to turn over uh, to Karen on our team to give a sense of why we think this is useful work to pursue. Uh, thanks, Justin. So we know that you have um, committed to or are under consideration um, of, for your board goal number four, the statewide the adoption or implementation of a statewide profile of a graduate uh, that would identify the knowledge and skills that all Kentucky learners need to become successful uh, citizens. We'd like to put forth for your consideration a couple of um, advantages to doing so um, and things that we think are strong reasons why this is a good goal to pursue. Um, and some um, just some considerations as you move forward with that. Just beg your pardon, because the board this morning that. Oh, so, uh, oh it, what happened this morning? Yes. Okay, great. 
Great job on improving the goal. We love it. Um, yeah, we, we think this is a worthy pursuit, so we're excited to hear that. And um, I think uh, we'd still, I'd love to just point out a couple of advantages and encouragement um, as you've already adopted this goal. Um, and some, some things to think about as you move forward in the implementation of it. So um, the next slide has um, really several advantages of the, of the statewide profile policy. Don't try to read all this. We're going to break this down um, item by item, but this is really just sort of uh, all of these advantages on one slide. So if we could move to the next, um, please. So one advantage of, of a statewide profile policy um, is that it's a real communicator to an entire state uh, that these are the uh, knowledge, skills, and dispositions that all Kentucky students need uh, in a global community and an ever-changing economy. Uh, this is a statewide statement about what matters uh, for all students in Kentucky. Um, the next slide really talks about um, connected to that statewide vision. Uh, this is an opportunity to really influence what instruction looks like. Uh, think about teachers designing learning experiences for students in classrooms. If they know they're working toward the kinds of things that are articulated on this anchor competency sheet, if they know that they're working toward making sure that all kids are engaged citizens and empowered learners, and then what does that mean at a second grade level and a fifth grade level and an eighth grade level, I think that has real implications for the design of what learning looks like. Uh, I think it's going to wind up being a, a, a more authentic, deeper learning experience uh, for students, um, which is what we want equitably across the entire state, not just district by district um, across the Commonwealth. So the next slide, um, really, you know, if you think about the, the, the statewide profiles that Justin walked us through, they're very future focused. They're very um, attuned to the kinds of competencies that kids are going to need looking forward, not just looking backward to the, to the core uh, content that we sometimes tend to focus on. These are really articulations that kids, to be globally competitive and global citizens, need to be able to be communicators and collaborators and innovative learners and all of those things. This is really about looking forward for the Commonwealth, um, not just looking sort of backward. The next slide um, really lays out um, then if you notice, also back to not only these anchor competencies that have already been articulated by the Kentucky Competency uh, Education Assessment Consortium, but also the other statewide profiles that we looked at, they're really a holistic version of what success looks like. They're not just limited to core content areas. They are really looking at what it takes to be a successful person, including well-being and uh, being a lifelong learner and being innovative and being a collaborator, all of those things that we care about. And it's a much broader picture of success than just what's measured by test scores um, easily. So that connects to our next sort of consideration for you here. This has real potential to inform what assessment and accountability looks like across the Commonwealth. So if we say these are the things that we care about for all students to know and be able to do, um, how are we incentivizing this in, um, in schools and in districts? How are we honoring this kind of learning? How are we measuring this? How do we know we're getting better at, for example, helping kids be empowered learners? So this is a broader definition of success and uh, can connect to the assessment and accountability work that's already underway through the uh, local labs of learning work um, that's, uh, that's happening now. And the last this really, last but certainly not least, this really gives us an opportunity to validate the good work that's already underway uh, in districts across the Commonwealth. Justin shared with us there are a number of local districts who've already developed their own local versions of this. This is an opportunity for us to say, we believe this is good and right for all students of Kentucky, um, and we want to support you in that effort uh, across the entire Commonwealth. So we applaud your adoption of the goal this morning. Um, and uh, just uh, wanted to say these are some things to consider moving forward in terms of implementation and how we use it. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to colleague May. So um, I'm sure that as we've been talking about this and, and discussing the implementation and applauding the implementation and adoption of uh, the goal this morning, you guys have had a lot of questions and we're now wanting to open the floor to any questions that you may have um, for our team or anyone else in the room um, who would like to discuss this topic further. All right. What questions do you have, Patrice? Um, 
going all the way back to your initial map where you were showing where you were already involved, there's a large gap in western Kentucky. What is the reason for that? So, I mean, it's, it's just historical in that, you know, we're strengthening in that area, and actually this year we actually have a partnership directly with GREC, the regional co-op in that region, to run a leadership academy directly in that region. Um, I would say one of the drivers is that, you know, the last couple of years has forced us to turn everything online, but previous to that, it was an on-site, we ran all this as on-site PE, and of course that represents the longest travel from Western Kentucky to come to an on-site PE. We've had Western Kentucky districts. Marshall County is a super strong anchor county in far West Kentucky. Logan County represents another anchor uh, for this kind of work. Trade County for a long time represented this kind of work. Allen County is building strength into it now. And so you have, and, and that, that, these are direct partners with us. That doesn't mean that's not, innovation is not happening outside of that. Owensboro Innovation Academy. We love the learning going on in Owensboro Innovation Academy. And so, and we have worked with Paducah on and off over the years. So it is, there is those relationships, but as we are now getting into direct partnership and actually offering some PD at Grex building in Bowling Green so that it's a little easier to make travel happen. No worries. What other questions do you have? I just want to share my district where I currently teach at the high school in Round County is having these conversations and working on a, a district wide policy with our high school administration. So I'm really excited to see where we go with that. Yeah, thank you. I would say Brown County is a partner that's about three years. We've had a relationship with Brown for about three years at, at the Center for Next Generation Leadership. And that actually is a really good indicator of the, it's a portrait of a graduate is almost always one of a district or a school's first steps into this work. And so that Rowan is doing that work right now is sort of totally on track with the timing that normally happens as they start to vision what do we want for kids, right? That's a fundamental question that this process forces you to wrestle with. But when you have those community conversations, and I'm sure there are probably conversations going on beyond just the board level, there are probably local community conversations, conversations with teachers, all of those conversations sort of help bring everyone to a new page of, well, this is what we actually want for kids in Morehead, right? As they build out that crazy glass farm out there, right? Like the future of agriculture in America is very tightly tied to Rowan, Rowan County right now, right? So I think that Rowan actually represents a really good example where the skills that kids need are shifting in real time. And uh, a district and a state being responsive to that is what this process sort of opens up. We actually have a container farm in our parking lot. Um, and my son came home on the first day of school and said, I got to plant lettuce today, Mom. And I said, well, there's a whole backyard, son. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, I'm sorry. I'm your son. Go ahead. I, I think that's a really good point that agriculture is really big there. So I could see where districts might push back some on a state profile. What, what kind of feedback are you getting from local superintendents because, I mean, there are different needs in different communities. So what would you say to that? I think you have the opportunity to think about flexibility in a state profile. I, one way to think about it, I'm not saying this is what you should do, I'm just mm -hmm. like, so Jefferson has one of these tied to their backpack work. Um, the board in Jefferson adopted five sort of skills that they're saying all kids in this city need these, but that local schools, we recognize there are differences across the district because it's such a large district. And so you then have the opportunity to adopt one profile skill that's local to you and live within their backpack thing and kids defend to that skill as well. That's one way to deal with this thing. You're absolutely right as we work with districts over the years. Spencer County was the first county that ever really like clued us into because the lake is there and they thought environmental, the future of that county is very t tightly tied to Taylorsville Lake and they wanted environmentalism to be central 
to what the future of their county is. Uh, that was a great moment for us to realize, yes, there are going to be some local variations about <coughs> what's important to these communities. And so as the board thinks about it, you might think about how could we build a bit of local flexibility. In, uh, yeah, I think, you know, in answer to that question, it's one of the things that, uh, you know, going back, because as you said, we were one of the first uh, ones joining your group back. When I thought it was just a few years, you had to remind me I'm getting so old because, yeah, in 2008, I went back to our, our plan to look at. Uh, but I think uh, what we have to look at when we're developing the learner profile or portrait of the graduate, we're talking about those, uh, you know, those 21st century skills that's underlying. We're not talking about pathways. So, you know, I can have a pathway in agriculture there, and I can have a pathway in pre-engineering -engineer here. And it's those learner profile skills that are going to make any child successful, whether he chooses that pathway or this pathway. When we were building Ignite in Northern Kentucky, one of the things that we did was, in working with uh, Lieutenant Governor's Workforce Development Ready, we had to show that whatever pathway that a child was choosing, we had the most five neediest ones that they were filling. But a child could go and progress anywhere along that continuum and then not have to start back over. So those skills were transferable. And that's mm -hmm. similar to what um, Project Lead the Way does, that you, you have to have certain skills for every Project Lead the Way class in order to finish. And I think that's it. So one, two years ago, I was looking back where, mm -hmm. where there is a KRS somewhere out there. And I was talking to David before on that, that a couple of years ago, we had to develop essential skills and get those uh, approved by the local work, workforce development. So, for example, in Northern Kentucky, uh, they will get a Northern Kentucky Chamber of Commerce Work Essential Skills Program if they can demonstrate from their local schools critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, and uh, punctuality and attendance. It gets into some of those root things. But uh, oral, effective and oral written communication, goal setting, planning, and organization. So each of the districts, so those were the skills in each of the districts develop their uh, assessment from that. I think the, the key that we have to have is what we're looking for, I, I would hope, that from the state when we're talking about deeper learning, that what we're saying then for a district is, how do we measure these certain things, and that's where that back page goes, so that that, to me, ultimately becomes our style of assessment in, in the state of Kentucky, that we're going to be successful to go to the post-secondary level because we do have some of those dispositions that we develop, hope, grit, well-being, as much as taking a test. Because one of my questions that I really would like to dive deeper in with a conversation with Commissioner Glass and, 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 our, and Aaron Thompson on is the fact that the, the test scores come out and they show 20 or 30 percent of our kids are only proficient in science when they're graduating. And, but we have 70% going on, and 60% of that 70% is being successful. So if we're only meeting that benchmark, are we really assessing the proper skills in order to be successful on the post-secondary level? And I think that's where the profile of a graduate really comes back into play, the deeper learning. Because there's some misconnection between our school report card out there, what we saw last week, and then Dr. Thompson saying that we're closing academic achievement gaps on the post-secondary, and we're graduating more kids than we ever graduated before. But if we look at our ACT scores over the last five years, they decline. But yet we're graduating more of those kids that's going on to post-secondary. So there's a mismatch there. So that's what I hope we get out of developing a deeper learning system. I completely agree with you. One of the real opportunities here that's in front of us is the opportunity to impact assessment and accountability, right? right? This is a broader net, a broader definition of success that includes Kentucky academic standards, right but also includes all these other things that we need to care deeply about, which may be more difficult to measure, but actually matter more. Right. Persistence, resilience, being, um, you know, having high level of agency and being a problem solver, collaborators, all of those things. The traditional tests that we've always depended on don't measure those things. And right. so we have an opportunity here to really advance a good conversation about what do we care about and what matters most and then how do we know we're getting better at these things. I think that's the real, the, the, the real power of a statewide, because currently, you've got districts that have developed their own locally, 
and they've got their own assessment systems internally and locally, but this but the state is not necessarily doing, having that same broader conversation, at least, you know, um, in, in a way that's so clearly communicated as, as with, uh, with right. the profile. So okay. I think it's an opportunity to say to those districts that already have local profiles, we see what you're doing, we've learned from it, we believe it's a good work and a worthy pursuit and in, in an in interest of equity, let's advance that across the entire commonwealth. And, and you guys said, and I know you work heavily with GRAC, and I know that, um, you know, um, Shelby County had, you know, I mean, when we were pushing the accountability system the other year in the situation, I know James Nyhoff in those meetings was always, you know, pounding, and David can tell us back there, and they got a good system that they were developing there also. Um, and I know he's also working at GREC, or not GREC, OVAC now. So hopefully we can get more OVAC back involved into that particular picture too. So what do you see going forward to go back to Holly's question here of gaining that momentum more? Because you've been at this for a while. How do, how do we reignite that passion that we gained from all those little boxes up there? Because now we have a 125 new superintendents out there that, that weren't around or don't even know really when Battelle came in with KASS the other year and did a profile of a graduate and could work with districts. How do we reignite that going forward? What are some things that we as a board then can do in this particular work to meet that, that goal that we put up there? You want to speak specifically to L3? Yeah. I mean, we have some shining light districts. So we want to let them run, right? Yeah. Like ideally. And then have a broader conversation that everyone has an opportunity to connect to. So you want to start maybe specific and then we can go wrong? Yeah, I think I think we can we should definitely learn from the folks who have already run way down the line on this and have done some internal work um, and have, have devoted significant effort locally to build out assessment systems. Um, that really begin to better answer the question about how can we measure these things that we care deeply about. I think that the uh, local labs of learning um, effort that is underway right now has real potential to inform this conversation in a serious way. So um, those you know, seven L3 districts and the next seven that are behind them um, are, are really piloting pro prototyping, developing a prototyping. Um, at least elements of assessment and accountability um, and the dimensions of assessment and accountability. I think learning from that, and I know that they're going to bubble up uh, learnings from that and, and send your way for consideration. So somewhere between learning from what's already underway, also, you know, really uh, given the, that next set of L3s or L7 or L, the seven L3s, the opportunity to bubble up their learnings to you um, is, uh, is going to be important. Um, I think um, the way this always starts um, is having lots of community conversations about what matters. Uh, and I think that's, that could be um, a next potential step um, in terms of a statewide conversation about what matters with the stakeholders. Um, so taking this conversation to the, Commer the Chamber of Commerce and the universities and, um, and all of those stakeholders that are students. I would also like to add that I feel like these conversations are taking place in districts. Maybe not the language of a profile of the learner, but after the last two years of being in the pandemic I and mean, seeing the effects of learning on students, what, what um, appetite students have for learning and where students are in gaining a more holistic view of students, um, it's really become important that we start looking at all the skills that students are bringing to the tables and how we're developing all of this so that they do become persistent learners even when challenges arise. So I think these conversations are happening statewide. And I think it is a perfect time um, for for us all to come together and have these conversations and open forums and talking about them together and developing the program. I don't, I don't disagree that they're taking place statewide, but I think they're taking place in different hot hot mechanisms as opposed to things. Just like on October 19th, we're doing lessons learned from the pandemic with our, our council, and Henry's going to be talking about their profile of graduate and how they're assessing that and moving forward so others can learn. But what I would, I personally would like to see is just uh, uh, that that web starting to connect better. Uh, and, and I think that's what our goal number four was, is how, how do we take these conversations that are happening and how do we tie them to a pinnacle that 
I mean, the last thing that I want is a profile graduate say, okay, this is what every Kentucky school district is. No, that's not what we want. What we want is this is what we consider to be an ultimate thing for you all to be shooting towards and looking at your own profiles of a graduate and having the flexibility for yours uh, there, but having that conversation that how, how do we how do we get there faster? I think Lee Todd said it earlier today when we were passing the goal. You know, you know we we passed in 1990 and we had the business support and we really we really pushed. We had that top 20 type of thing like they did, but then in the last five years we've lost enthusiasm somewhere along the line. And how do we gain that enthusiasm back with the chamber with with the, hey, I think accountability. I love it. I'm just saying, I, I want to get there faster than we're, we're kind of moving. That's, that's our concern, or my concern. There's not as much time to wait, you know. Yeah. I, I think accountability is a real cornerstone to this. The state holds that lever, and it's powerful. It's, in, it's a powerful communicator to parents and stakeholders, um, universities, but also to local school districts who have been doing this work. I think um, I think a, a very clear statement from this board to say we are willing to consider um, what accountability uh, might look like under a system where we clearly articulate this broader definition of success uh, is 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 strong, an important move to advancing this work in a very serious way. I just want to jump in here. You know, I'm just just talking with so many teachers in the field. I, you know, I think yes, they have lost a lot of enthusiasm, but I think part of that is because of sort of a compliance-driven curriculum and the testing that uh, that has evolved over the years from accountability. And, you know, I think that spark of any kind of creativity being part of teaching has largely been driven out of education. And I, you know, and I think it's hard to, it's hard to talk about the excitement when there's not that sense of creativity and agency among the ed educators in the classroom. So that to me has to be part of the discussion and pulling in educators to be participants in that discussion. You know, so often it is administrators, it is, you know, people, maybe college level people who are pulled in, but the educators themselves are ignored in the conversation. And so I think we have to find ways to pull in our teachers and give them the opportunities to be part of the discussion. Yeah, and I think if, if you if we're just have a discussion, uh, if you follow the profile of graduates mm -hmm. that's laid out by as Leader 21 or Patel by kids, they do do that. The school, you're, you're correct, the schools that don't do that miss the boat. I mean, and it starts with that community-wide conversation. And you not only have it with your community, I think that's where the, the mix comes in. First of all, you have that. But you also have that community conversation with students. You have that community conversation with teachers, staff members, and it's not easy. It's kind of like, you know, I'll give Jason credit, the, the uh, you know, like you're listening to it. You got to listen to lots of different things to come up with this because if you're just listening to one side, it's it's never going to be successful. So I, no, I echo no. what you say. But I, but I do think it's. But it's, I think a lot of districts do miss that boat. Right, they do. They do. I mean, you know, student. I mm -hmm. mean, student boy. I mean, we talked about student that. Student voice. So we're, mm -hmm. Is you know in, in Boone, I've been I was fortunate to be in a very progressive district. You know, we had a student board rep for 25 years, so we always listened to our students. But yet we we're still debating that you know across this Commonwealth today. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we are talking about that in, in Miss you know the the complimentary thing of doing the listening tour that that's an example of getting started. Mm -hmm. And then but you got to continue listening and continuing touring. And that's the hardest part of all this. And, and, and I'll throw some you know credit back out, not just because you're in the room, but. The, the thing, the hardest thing is doing the list, uh, or, or the easiest thing is doing the listening tour when you start. The hardest part is implementing that listening tour because people still want you to be doing a listening tour as you're also trying to implement and go out and do the next steps. So it's, it's a fine balance, uh, but I agree with you wholeheartedly, is what I'm saying. And if we don't, if we don't 
increase the mix if we just take this as a top-down approach that we're not going to be successful here. Okay, Allison? I um, love the opportunity anytime I get to brag on my district, but a few years ago we were um, working really hard to become a national schools to watch and, and won that recognition. I'm very proud of that at our middle school. But one of the things we did is we implemented what we called a leadership retreat. And we worked with our local chamber of commerce and we invited different business people and lots of community members, parents, lots of different people in on a Saturday and all of our faculty and staff and students from our student voice team. And what we did that day, one of the first ones we had, we developed what we called a rubric for a soft skills, work skills kind of thing that we wanted to see our students do. Um, from that, then we, we decided that we wanted this to be something we communicated with parents. So students were, were given this rubric, and every time that a report card went home at progress time, they got not only their ABC grade, but they got a one, two, three based on their work skills. Were they on time for class? Did they have materials? Did they have the things they needed? Did they have their homework? Um, those kind of things. So parents not only saw their grade, but then they saw what are they doing. So it also sometimes answered the question why the grade wasn't where it was supposed to be. And then sometimes they were perfectly not top-notch students, but we saw they needed to work on their soft skills or vice versa. They had great soft skills, but it wasn't showing up and helping them. So that gave us more information than just how they're doing academically. Um, but it, it became a great thing because parents then were calling us and having more communications with teachers and how can I help them in this area. So we're getting ready to implement that at the high school level as well. And I really like that, that we're, we're communicating that with parents. Um, but it was a great process because we've worked with all of the stakeholders. The community people got to say, this is what we want to see in someone who's graduating from your schools and the skills that they need. And then parents got to have input, students got to have input, but also the teachers that we're talking about said, what can we do and we need from you in the community of support so that we can help these students. So it's a great process. I'd love anyone out there that wants to know more about it, I'd be glad to share that, but it was a great program. So you mentioned several states in your opening that have developed a state profile. Have they assessed that yet? And what kind of results are they seeing in those states? So I um, say Vermont probably furthest down the line been really moving diligently in this direction for, um, for a, a long period of time. The other thing they're advancing with their profile is the competencies that go with it and all the assessments that go with it. I would say um, most states are newer in that, but they are seeing schools more closely attend to those competencies as they are articulated from the state. So lots of those efforts are looking like things like students developing portfolios of work um, aligned to the competencies. Um, they're seeing a lot more uh, defenses of learning, exhibitions of learning um, aligned to those competencies. Um, and so um, I would say uh, for the states that are furthest down the line, they're probably most developed. Vermont, I would say, is probably furthest down the line. Um, other states like New Mexico, a little newer to it. Um, uh, but that's what it's looking like. It's looking more like portfolios kind of work exhibitions, defenses, that kind of thing. Do they have any way to measure out after they leave the school, like if it were, you know, out in the real world? And is that any part of what they're looking at? Um, I, there, I think there are some mechanisms to do that. I don't know that I have the answer for that right now, but we can certainly dig into it and bring it back to you. Um, I think you have to look at a really long picture. So things like persistence through college, things like, um, you know, uh, economic success. Uh, I think it's a really, you got to take a really long view on those kinds of things, um, which is part of why this is hard. People want short answers about if I make a change now, you know, what's my result tomorrow? Um, but I think that's certainly something that we can uh, do a little more research into and bring back to you. Because I, I, I keep looking back at that first definition, it's a community-wide vision. And I wondered if there was some way to, if the community has said, yes, it made a difference. Well, I, I think that, I mean, it's just like anything else. There are examples of that out there. I mean, Texas and Georgia has been at this for a while for an alternative assessment system, working with you know, John Tanner and different people like that. Ohio also, too. I remember going to a particular workshop there. And, of course, they had the A through S system, which was not a very good system. And one of the things that we had always fought against here, you know, early on, uh, but the school system was always failing, okay? And it was a small school district. So they said, okay, well, how are we going to get a bond levy passed? Because there's a difference from there. Well, and they did an alternative mechanism. And what they did is they found out in that particular district, 
the thing that was most important was the agricultural skills. So they determined that they were going to focus on that. Sure enough, two years later, they passed their bond revenue into different things. Because that's the thing about a profile. If, if, if you're developing it correctly, you're developing it with your community in mind and, and those important assets back with your community. So I think that's that's the hard part. That's why when when you all selected Jason and, and um, you know and I came to the board late, obviously, but you know step three of the accountability system is what really was was my part of being energized here. Is I think that uh, we're blazing that trail. We don't have those answers, but we're that pioneer that is willing to to take that long term view to create it. It's not going to. It's not going to be there in five years. It's like Shelby County. It's been working, you know, in Boone. We worked since 2008. Our goal was 2020. We were moving to a competency-based system, and we still are. One of the things we had to do, the first thing, which was very difficult, was change the grading scale from, you know, zero to 100. To, uh, but we had to bring in the university colleague, Jay Matig, or, Jay, or uh, Jay from the one on, doing a hybrid system so that we could do competency based in the elementary, but do a hybrid how that turned over. And then we created a system and we said, okay, no student, we're not going to accept failure. Uh, so we would only have a one, two, or three because you couldn't pass a four. So if you didn't complete by the end of May, you had to come back until June 30th. So you had extended school year for everybody that didn't meet grade level assessment. Right now. We were developing those this type of thing, they're they're still in their infancy, infancy. Uh, so, but what we had said at the time was, it's the kindergartners coming in that's going to be a, totally assessed at this thing, exiting 12th grade. But we're going to up the standards and skills along the way. Uh, so I think that's where your heart. It's just like here, we're going to have to probably. It's a long game. Better. Yeah. yeah, it's a long game, and we'll. You'll have stuff you're going to have to answer to the feds on, no matter what. They're always going to have their thing, but then it's going to be, what do we look at later? I know that, you know, our career pathway, because of that, and working with Dr. Uh, Porsche, uh, the Associate Commissioner in ATC, it's Dr. Porsche. 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 Yeah, Porsche. Yeah, Porsche. yeah Porsche. We, we created additional, I mean, he's been a godsend to us, created those additional pathways so that we could show the benefit of that career college, you know, so I, I, I just, this is the work that, that I feel that why I'm here. It's yeah. not all the other stuff. We can see you have a lot of passion. Well, it's, it's because that's that's where the future, that's, you know, as Lee Todd said, that's where our future yeah. is. How do we move from COVID? And we got to deal with COVID, I know that. But how do we thrive after COVID? How do, how do we thrive after COVID? I don't want to manipulate it. <laughs> Chair, that, Chair, thanks. Um, I just wanted to step in and, and actually, to your point, Ms. Glad. Um, a couple of things about the document that you have in front of us, because I think it's important to bring this down to the state. Um, the consortium that this document is created from is a consortium of districts that are part of our Kentucky Innovative Learning Network, which is about 35 districts across the state. A lot of those same dots on the map. Um, and the work that was done in these districts was to first create this and I think you'll be, you, won't be, you may or may not be surprised. If you look at profiles of graduates across the country, these five are on almost every one of them. They may be named a little bit differently, but to your point, Chair Bloodworth, these are all things that every kid needs, and it doesn't matter if they're, as, as Mr. Poe said, going through a pre-med program where they're going to be a welder. They still need these skills. So that's why these came out, because those districts said, well, we've got that one, and we've got that one, and these were the ones that were common to everybody. So it's a good place to start. Those other states that my friends at UK mentioned, they basically have the same idea. You take these five, or whatever number they have, and you add. If your local district wants something else in addition to these, but we really think every kid in Kentucky or every kid in South Carolina or Vermont needs these. On the back, to your point, Ms. Blatt, these outcomes were developed by teachers in the districts that participated in this consortium work. So we spent 
days. It was like a standard setting process. You know. So we spent days developing these outcomes at the grade levels. And then, of course, COVID hit. The only district in the state that has really, your, your question about other states and what they were doing, Shelby County, to Mr. Poe's point, has really, they're actually measuring these things now using this. So um, they're probably our, our one, we just haven't gotten everybody back to doing this yet. Um, there were about 11 districts ultimately in this consortium. Um, but it all ties into the, lear the learning, listening tours, the state coalition that was formed after the listening tours, and now, as Karen mentioned, the local laboratories of learning work, which is exactly what all of you all have been talking about. It's a community-based conversation about what does our local community, and Karen mentioned the seven districts that are starting that this fall, um, communities across the state from very small, Frankfort Independent, to Jefferson County, um, and then seven more the year after that. So I think we're all on the right, we're on the right trajectory, as Mr. Post said. Those to get pre-selected, too. I mean, you... You, you had to put in an application process. I mean, it's not open to anybody. So those numbers you're talking about are preset by you all or somebody. Well, yeah, we, we, we did. And what we did was we used our innovative learning network because we knew those districts were the ones who had leadership that was ready to take these, these chances. And Boone County is one of those seven as well. Not the first seven, the second seven, but that was their choice. Um, new leadership in the district, of course. So, um, but that's where we are. I just wanted to, to so, make sure we had a little bit more info on this document yes. that you had. So as we get ready to move forward toward our goal, you all are doing work like this. The consortium is doing work like this. Are there other groups doing work like this in the state that we should know about? I mean, it feels like we need to pool resources. Agree. I think L3 brings a lot of it together. You've got the um, um, the CIE folks, um, the um, you've got student voice team, uh, the Kentucky student voice team involved in that, heavily involved in that joint effort between CIE, KDE, NextGen, the districts themselves, um, the statewide coalition that brought in lots of other stakeholders. I think. Um, it, to me, it feels like there have been pieces and parts of this floating around for a long time and underway in, in lots of different ways and lots of different lanes. Could that be, could that effort, that statewide effort, be a way to bring it all into a cohesive picture and plan for, uh, for blazing a path forward? Um, I, to me, that's, that's a big part of this, um, the path forward for this. So when we saw the map with the, the, the points, there are more points in the state. Like, would you say there are more places that are doing things that aren't represented in your work? Or is that pretty much everyone not that's doing this? Yeah, not too many. I mean, we overlapped from the very beginning. I mean, David and I actually can go back over a decade now. But there was the State Innovation Lab network going back a long time ago. So we've been running alongside each other this entire time. And the districts that have been working directly with KDE are usually next-gen supported districts. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of serve as a back channel kind of helpful PD resource in the background to help them sort of get some of the work done. And then as soon as some of the work grows up a little bit, they're ready to start collaborating. And that's more when KDE comes in, to start bringing districts together to how to collaborate. So there is this sort of pool of districts that are, they're ready to go. I will like channel my inner superintendent, which I'm not, and I don't want to be. They need a, they would benefit tremendously from a signal from the state board or some entity in Frankfurt that this path will lead to the future of the accountability system. All many, many stand on the sideline and will know it's serious when there is a clear pathway that a path. You could go down this road and be assessed as a district this way, or you could choose to be assessed in a traditional way, right? Like in many states, like a Vermont, has created a way to be assessed in a competency model 
and districts then can have a choice. Do I want to be a competency-based district and get assessed by the state in a competency way, or do I want to be a traditional district and assessed in a traditional way? In the near term, I sort of like that choice. As an innovator, one of the, you know, we had the CARA moment in Kentucky, but it, the CARA moment wasn't all in shift the whole system at once moment. We have the opportunity to pilot, learn, grow, fix mistakes. And so, I mean, I think as an innovator, I always like the approach of let's try it, work out some things that aren't going to work well, and get them out before we try to implement a whole statewide model at one and, moment. And David, when we passed the assessment system before, I mean, that's, that's in there is the alternative. That's what you guys are actually working towards, is it not? Yeah, so I mean that's and you I mentioned think you explained it well the difference between the two, but that's where and you mentioned Mr. Poe, you mentioned the, um, the the federal versus the state. Yeah, we still have federal requirements so that, that we have to follow, but there are also federal waiver process possibilities uh, towards moving to something new. And and just to, to echo what Justin said, um, I think we could look back ten years, Justin, and the same 35 or 40 districts are on the list from the beginning, right? And that's to Jason, Justin's point. Those are the ones that have, have sort of taken the risk and said, we're going to do the right thing, even if we're sort of in a little bit of a conflict with our assessment accountability system. And the rest need that nudge. They need to know that something different is going to happen, and, and then you may see more so I think we're kind of stuck on that 35 to 40 number right now, Chair, and that's because they're, the rest are sort of backing away from it a little bit. And I think if they have felt some confidence that things would change, they would be more likely to participate in the work. Yes. Allison. Is there a way, there seems to be several, like, as you mentioned, groups and entities that are working on this. Is there a way to make some kind of working group as we're as a committee working on this, so we could get all of these people in the same, not all of the representation from these groups, like the Next Gen, Kentucky Student Voice Team, the Consortium, L3, and even maybe some representatives from the districts that have been doing the work that could put their minds together in the same space for a amount of time to come up with some ideas then that we could use. Because it just seems like there's a lot of people doing a lot of great work, and, and I would want to hear from representatives of those people to, to come up with their final, you know, what we need to do as a state on this topic. I think that's a great idea. Um, we can certainly talk about that. Sure. Correct. Um, I'd just add a little to this conversation. Um, I think that there are a number of strong historical capacities around deeper learning that Kentucky has uh, that trace back to CARA. I mean, the, the, what was uh, behind the once you look past the sort of governance and uh, funding reforms, CARA was an instructional reform, or was intended to be, and it was a deeper learning experience that it was trying to bring about. Um, and uh, to some degree, that got caught in the uh, complexity of what that work really t requires, and it ran headlong into a uh, basic skills-focused accountability system with no child left behind. Uh, so those two things, I think, really uh, uh, hamstrung it. Uh, and they continued. A, a focus on basic skills and what you can easily measure on a standardized test continue to be the gravity that keeps this from taking off. Um, it, uh, we, we cannot escape conversations around all we need to be focusing on are basic skills for kids. Reading is important. Math is important. Basic science concepts are important. Well, of course they're, uh, but they're not enough. And they haven't been enough for decades, and they increasingly are going to have less and less utility for us going forward. But our, we know that our assessment systems are built around those things. Uh, I would add, in addition to all the capacities that we have in uh, Kentucky, are all the systems at the university level, at the, at the state level, the things that David has been doing for years here. Uh, that we're now just uh, building on and amplifying the work that's happened in different districts that are part of or independent from uh, consortia. Uh, all of that stuff is pulling in the same direction. But I want to emphasize that 
um, it, all of that has limited impact if because it's macro level, right? We're talking about consortia, system, supports, state, district, stuff you layer over. The only thing that matters is what is the student experience. And is that, is that changing? Is that different? And I've walked through thousands of classrooms, um, and I, I don't see a lot of it being different yet. Uh, so sometimes you see little glimmers of where things are breaking through or different practices. But unless all of this effort and talk from the board and the university and the department and the, and the consortia and all the way down the line, unless it gets to the micro level, what is the student experience and is, is that different? It doesn't matter. Right? This is all window dressing. And the gravitational pulls of basic skills and what's easy to measure will keep us from ever escaping that. So just put that forward. as That's got to be where the work is. It's how do you change the experience in students. Thank you for kind of bringing us back to that child-centered focus because we do get caught up in all of this and that is where it really matters. Uh, one other uh, just quick element that I would add to this uh, mix of supports is that uh, KDE we re recently uh, joined the Deeper Learning Dozen which was a, a set that in the United States and Canada a set of districts that were doing this. We're now the first state agency that's involved in that. And with with the um, one of the guiding principles of that work being that the the shift that you need is to get at the micro level, and it has to emerge from practitioners. You already have people that are really good at this, and they are experimenting and trying things. And uh, from a leadership perspective, at UK or KDE or the consortia that exists or districts. We can either accelerate that or we can kill it. Um, and we've seen a lot of over the past couple of decades a lot of squashing of, of that or keep limiting it or trying to contain it. Um, so, so I think that that has to be the frame all of us bring into this work from the, from the board and from the, these macro level roles that we have is how do we work to be and a support and an accelerator of the kinds of practices that are already emerging from schools versus entities that uh, squash this. That's, uh, you know, it's almost like it needs to be as grassroots as possible and we need to put the fertilizer to... Right. Unless it changes at the grassroots level, it, it's not different. It hasn't changed. Well, and, and that's really where my comments and I hope to go. It, it, because if it's not happening in the classroom, all of this is just a waste of time. And, you know, and that's where I see that they, a huge breakdown occur. Um, you know, when teachers are told, you know, to follow a curriculum with fidelity and that they need to be on a certain lesson on a certain day. You know, those are the kinds of things where that kind of pressure put on teachers totally erodes that ability to, to change what's going on in the classroom. I agree, and I think the same thing about for students as well. I, think. I don't think any of this is complete without student input or collaboration, like it says on the back. Um, um, most often times, I think, especially with something as um, important as this, we have to have uh, student input. And, I understand that we do have data and that we do have this foundation of what a student needs and uh, it's very broad in that sense, but we also need that students to leverage that, that point. And so we have these great organizations, but I mean, as, as we said previously, we also need local, local um, just voice as well. And so in addition to, you know, the the organizations that are working on this from the student perspective. We need to work on especially uplifting those student initiatives from both local levels as well so that uh, they can too impact their district's uh, uh, profiles of the graduate because I I, I just don't think we, we can't have this without actual knowledge from the graduate themselves. Uh, it looks like our other committee that's meeting has finished up too so uh, if are there any more questions i think this is just the beginning of a really it really important work that we've made a goal and i know that i have grown leaps and bounds in this session with you all and appreciate all of the information 
Um, anybody else have a question? If not, I have then, a oh, comment yes. for uh, this team. Uh, this is powerful capacity. Uh, the work that UK's Next Gen team does is uh, really important for us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, much. so we do need a motion to adjourn. Um, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Right. And a second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you.